Today I have Maryam Sohail with me. She's a very dear friend. Uh, she's a marriage and family therapist. She's a graduate of Northwestern University. She's been working for more than twelve years, uh, and we have lots of questions for her today. Hi, Maryam. Hello, Mar. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited for this talk of ours today. Of course. Uh, Maryam, in preparation for today's talk, I put it on my social media. If people had any sort of questions that they wanted to post to a marriage therapist, mm. and um, there, there's lots of things I want to cover. Uh, but one mm. thing I noticed is is that mostly the questions were received from females, maybe apart from one male who, who mm. wrote uh, to me. What do you make of that? Why? Why is it only women who who have trouble in in their in their relationships? So. um i am also wondering if the demographic is mainly you know south asian women or w- women from yes. our culture yeah so in, in in my experience our family systems are a bit oppressive <laughs> to women just by the fact that very early on when the marriage starts they have to make a transition which is not that necessary which is you know they move from one family and they migrate into another family and there's a lot of uh that's that's uncharted waters right and nobody's there to tell them that this is how it's going to go um that i think in itself uh mm. raises a lot of anxieties and queries and questions and they would like to Uh, to solve resolve them they would like mm. to have a point of reference and i've experienced that in a lot of like women's group on facebook and all of that 90 80% of the queries are about husbands and mother in laws and family systems and in laws right and maybe 10% are about my kids and all of that and i've i myself have been wondering why that is such a pressing issue you know mm. nobody's out there talking about their own development their own concerns the, you know what's uh, because this is so present this distress uh which is coming uh from being a part of a family system um which is not their own <laughs> and mm-hmm. being in such close proximity of that family system and kind of seeing Uh, function and dysfunction and the difference and really absorbing some of the anxieties i think that's where the angst comes from and there's very little guidance that can come from very their own families guidance. of origin or other yes. places so there's yes. a general distress i want to ask a related question to that which is that a lot of times i'm imagining that uh, these are people who are coming in and they're saying oh but the problem is my husband or the problem is my mother in law which a lot of these questions were that mm-hmm. if you have this sort of a husband if you have a narcissistic mm-hmm. husband or if mm-hmm. my mother in law is like this like mm-hmm. that so when there is an identification that here is the problem and then mm-hmm. when that comes to you mm-hmm. is that how it is or is there more to that so generally when uh people come in you know you work a lot with individual uh clients but for me uh, the couple comes in together right mm-hmm. so they usually come in pointing fingers you know at mm-hmm. each other or at difficult relationships around them and uh, when we start to uh unpack that and see what actually happens right uh v- we tend to see that the the picture is a lot more complex the system that mm-hmm. they're living in is a lot more complex and a lot of times distress that they're experiencing within the couple relationship is coming from the environment and they don't have enough recognition of that mm-hmm. right and sometimes internal distress that's been you know maybe let's say coming from my family of origin how i was brought up how i was trained to speak about emotions or not speak about them how i was raised to handle conflict all of that has now come into play right mm, mm. and i don't recognize that i i just recognize that oh you're not listening and she's the one who's interfering or mm. you know something else is happening i'm not looking at how my um relational blueprint my relational you know map has been mm-hmm. activated via marriage what is presented as a symptom um is a manifestation of probably 
something else that's happening in the system. You know, it's it's almost the same as, you know, when your knee hurts, a lot of times your problem is with the shoulders. You know, they're not aligned and the knee is where all the weight is going and that's what is hurting. And mm. if you operate the knee, mm. <laughs> you know, the other knee will start to uh, to show the symptom because you haven't really corrected the system. So do you, do you see that couples are more in distress today than they were 10 years ago? Has something changed um, in, in terms of environmental factors or other stressors? Yeah. Yeah, I think generally um, we are in the midst of a mental health crisis, mm. you know, diagnoses for um, anxiety disorders and depression, mood disorders. They've gone like way up in the last 10 years. So, of course, that's going to uh, be present in a marriage also. But generally, I think in the last 10 years is also like, you know, dual career couples and uh roles are becoming more egalitarian um, in the relationship. And I don't think uh, we're prepared to receive that so quickly. Right now, those roles are in friction with how, how you know, we were raised. So what is demand of this new, uh, new, you know, times? We are not prepared for that. So that poses a lot of, you know, okay, how do we change? What do we change? And generally, um, high stress, mental health issues translate into very little um, ability to be tender. And mm. relationships and romantic relationships happen in the arena of tenderness, right? Mm. If you don't find space for that, and if you don't... Um, kind of um, create intentionally that space if you don't intentionally create that space of tenderness um, you 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 will have a relationship with which will have a lot of angst mm -hmm. you know okay so some of that is from the environment some of that is being carried uh, in in those relationships and i think that's that's something very uh, so that, that's something that's a very interesting lens that how all of that being carried is being carried into the relationship yeah. and the tenderness that's required to mm. hold and connect mm. and then then that changes mm. yeah you know because you have seen that in the last 10 years everything has become so so much more competitive you mm. know so it, you will see that in relationships also relationships themselves have become so competitive you know uh between the two partners because the last 10 years you're shaped through like college and all those uh, experiences that you have had has prepared you for, for, for that. It hasn't really yeah. prepared you for a more open and tender and open-minded experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But you, um, uh, one, one of my favorite authors, Terry Real holds that view that historically speaking uh, within family systems to to get their needs met men have used aggression and women have used emotional manipulation how how much does that hold true in our cultural context do you see that happening because a lot of times and, and, and a lot of questions i received on my social media were around that my husband is narcissistic my mother-in-law is blah blah my husband is verbally abusive my husband gaslights how do you survive that how do you do that so What's your experience of that space? So I, uh, from what you're telling me, it looks like you're specifically uh, talking about, about uh, women's voices, you know. Uh, so I want to point that out because I think men's voice is missing in the relational arena. And I've been trying to tap into that. And that's why I remember your, your article went so viral <laughs> because it was giving a voice to two men, you know, which is otherwise Absolutely. absent. Yeah. So uh, I think that first of all, uh, we need to not see that we need to not really um, assume that that is the reality because we haven't really heard the other voice. Um mm -hmm. The other thing is these these like gaslighting and narcissist narcissism are now very popular terms, right? Mm -hmm. And you and I know that 
narcissistic personality disorder is a, is a clinical diagnosis with very little prognosis uh, where a person has very little insight into their own um, you know behavior patterns and how they're impacting others and harming others right um, so that's the clinical part of it mm. however inability to see and hear uh, your partner or the other person is also very common in uh, is a very common relational problem right mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be clinical narcissism 80 percent of the problems in a, within a couple is arise from the place where I don't feel heard I don't feel mm -hmm. seen I don't feel seen as a woman I don't feel uh, appreciated as a woman um, um, and that doesn't mean that my uh, I am not winning the argument you know it, it's it's uh, it's a rather subtle experience uh, where my quality of my experience is not um, it does not have space in the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a very common dynamic. And that's what we kind of undo in therapy or we create more space for both people's experiences and create that under uh, skill, capacity in both partners to see each other and to hear each other, mm -hmm. you know? Because not being seen, and you know that that happens in individual therapy also, not being seen is such a painful experience yep. you know kids growing up who don't feel seen it's such a painful experience so when your partner is not able to see that a lot of times that's re-wounding the you know <laughs> the kind of recreating the experience for you that you had growing up so a lot of times that's what we are kind of doing in therapy identifying in what ways they're not able to see and hear each other and then creating space for that. Okay. Yeah, and earlier, Mariam, we were speaking about it. That from, from this, we would assume that it's, it's always sort of a woman who is coming in saying this is a problem and my husband is not willing to come in and they're not willing to come and speak about this. How, how, do you, how do you view couples? Who gets in touch? Who's getting help? Are men willing to? Do they also get in touch? Yeah. So generally, whoever is in distress mm. <laughs> seeks help more, mm. you know, whoever is carrying the distress in the relationship. Um, it's different. So, for example, if um, a woman is in the relationship is getting in touch, she's the one who's carrying the distress. That doesn't mm. mean that the husband or the partner in the relationship is completely living a smooth life mm. right mm. so uh there's one party usually who's more vocal about their distress who's more aware of the distress but usually both of them are going through distress in mm. my experience you know growing number of men in the past let's say three years i'm i'm receiving more um more and more requests from men uh, to come into couples therapy, right? Um, and I think a lot of times when they come in, I, I've seen a lot of men also suffer. And I, I have a kind of a soft spot for them because when they have very little spaces to talk about it, women still are have that kind of emotional intelligence to create those spaces for themselves, um, you know, with their family of origin, with their girlfriends, online communities. They're very resourceful like that. Um, very few men, I think, I think are able to talk about their marriages with anyone, uh, even to their close friends. They don't. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that would be my experience of working with a lot of men uh, that that might be the only space where, where they're talking about these matters mm. and they might have friends who they've known for decades, right. but they don't take that there. Or they, it comes up in misogynistic jokes. That that's yeah. Yeah. you know that's yeah. their way of expression. Yeah. You know that's how they're expressing their distress. Absolutely. Yeah, 
Yeah, that, oh, well, what's the point? I mean, my wife is not going to listen anyway, or she's busy yeah. with the kids or something. Yeah. Instead of... Yeah, uh, women and, are and just like needs. that. Absolutely. So about, I, I wanted to know just about that, that when when the person's needs are not being met, and more often than not, it might be a woman who's saying, well, my partner is not attending to me. He's out with his friends. His mother is like that. He sort of doesn't pay attention to me or something like that. And let's say uh, they're equally also saying that it doesn't work. We've tried to ask them, let's go to marriage therapy. And, or that option is not even available to them or they can't afford it. What can what can the person do in their everyday life sort of just to help that situation? Are there any skills that might help or any tips you might have there? So generally, I think identifying your needs and communicating them directly mm. rather than launching it as a complaint, mm. you know, uh, for example, you know, can we go out for dinner tonight or I really want to eat out tonight uh, rather than um, saying you never take me out, you never pay attention to what, what I want, right? Um, yeah. And I think a very good resource for that is um, uh, the Gottman Institute. You can look that up online. It has very, you know, uh, three decades of research available on uh, what differentiates a long-term happy couple from mm -hmm. a couple that splits up, you know, within the first five years of their marriage. And what they saw was that there are four factors called the four horsemen, you know, which are really detrimental to a romantic relationship. Um, contempt, criticism, stonewalling, and, uh, and there's one more. Defensiveness. Defensiveness, yes. Yes, thank mm. you. So mm. defensiveness. So if you're using, ident learn to identify those in your communication, in your communication, not your partner's, <laughs> because when you're doing that, you're being critical, mm. right? So uh, learn to um, identify those and then try the antidotes, you know, and the antidotes are basically, you know, having soft start startups. And even if, a, if you want to bring up something which is difficult, like finances or family related issues, have a, st star, a soft startup that, look, I want to uh, talk to you about something. I don't want to uh, make you feel like you're the problem. Here is what I'm feeling and focus on what your experience and your need is, right? So I think in my opinion, that that really helps. The other thing I think gets really missed out and is underappreciated is again, what Gottman calls bids for connection, mm -hmm. that you're looking to connect with your partner in ways that are subtle and un not really always verbal. Yeah. And mm. if you respond to those bids, it strengthens the relationship. Mm. Yeah. And if you miss those bids, uh, fail, uh, the partner would, would not bid again. The, the frequency uh, would go down to, um, you know, for couples who are already in conflict, it'll be like 0% of the times they'll try mm -hmm. again. And uh, couples who are actually happily married, 26% of the time they will try and re reconnect, right? So it's really important to attend to those bids. For example, you know, if it's like I'm saying, oh, the weather is lovely today. Mm -hmm. What I'm actually saying is I would like to enjoy that with you. Come pay attention to me and mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. do something mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. If my partner misses that, mm -hmm. right, uh, it's unlikely that I will go back the same day and be like, hey, let's do something again. So those those cues and a lot of that gets, that's a learning curve. Yeah. When you get married, that's what you learn, how to read each other's uh, bids for connection, right? And there's not enough guidance available in the early year, years of your marriage because you're live, mostly you're living in a system that doesn't let you even pay attention to what's going on between the two of you. <laughs> it's always stealing the focus. I, I also want to know a lot of people are interested in um, 
the dynamic between a son uh, and their mother. And I'm imagining that in our cultural context that that can have uh, repercussions for a marriage. Uh, a, a few women have asked that, that our marriage is being disrupted by, by my mother-in-law or her relationship with her son. So how, how do you see that space? What, what is this about? So uh, in my experience, any um, parental relationship, if you haven't really differentiated from that, you know, mother, son, or mother, daughter, if you haven't differentiated from that enough, uh, you're, that's going to impact your marriage negatively, right? So since we are actually hearing this women's voices mm -hmm. in, in, in this, um, you know, conversation, and a lot of times we are actually uh, when it comes to relationships, uh, we are hearing women's voices. So we are looking at, okay, mother-son relationship. But equally problematic is the mother-daughter relationship, okay. right? And when the daughter has gotten married and she's too involved in the family of origin, uh, husband is almost dispensable some of the times, Right. So her, her loyalties and her heart still lies with whatever goes on in the family of origin um, and very little mental and emotional space available to the husband and the kids. You know, those are like duties and this is pleasure. <laughs> so similarly uh, with, with men in very enmeshed uh, relationships with their parents, mother and uh, father, very little emotional intimacy to give to the wife mm. Mm. right mm. because with with their with their parents and with their mothers they have created very intimate spaces mm. yeah they come back and they share their day first with their moms mm. you know they they seek advice from the from the mom they keep whatever comes out of their you know mother's mouth is very sacred mm. so uh, there's a lot then limited space for intimacy for the woman in their life and then there's like they're pitting them against each other you know they're, they're mm. not spaces that that, mm. that are competitive in nature they're very different spaces yes. and if you haven't individuated enough then you don't have the capacity to hold a relationship which is mm. which is intimate and that uh, demands that from you and and this this can be a very good connection with um with a with a question that a lot of uh, women have asked around infidelity, which is that I'm imagining that something around the same dysfunction. I don't know how that works. Um, that if if there are those predefined roles, what what a woman is is, is doing in her relationship, what a man is doing, somewhere or the other, they have unmet needs, and that creates mm -hmm. that creates some sort of um, that some sort of that charge towards uh, another person. So how, how, how do you see infidelity? Is that on the rise? Uh, have you just sort of started noticing that a lot more? If it is, then what are the reasons? Mm. for? How do you heal through that? So I think a lot of people who are in therapy have some form of or um, some experience with infidelity, you know? Even if it is something like, you know, watching porn and the <laughs> wife is not really okay with that, right? Uh, from that to having uh, emotional intimacy and, you know, partners not being okay with that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's on the spectrum. So most people that you work with, there's some form of infidelity that you pick up. But then there are cases that are presented to you for in infidelity. Like there are couples who are seeking help just because, you know, infidelity has been uncovered and discovered or being confessed, you know. <laughs> so uh, that is, um, and they, when, when they come in, it is very painful space for both of them. You know, we usually just identify with or try to work a lot with the party who is being cheated on. Mm -hmm. But I think the party who cheats is also in equal distress, you know, <laughs> and I think that never gets recognized enough. Um, the other thing is infidelity just 
rocks the foundation of a marriage. Mm. Yeah. However, I always um, kind of give some hope to the couples that I work with that infidelity is not the is not the end of a marriage. It's beginning mm. of a new marriage. Okay, uh -huh. because after something like that has been exposed, they actually get an opportunity to uh, choose each other again or not. So I think but that's... a lot of times culturally, uh, the messaging that that might be given is even shame around that, which is that, oh, you're accepting something, which is, I mean, a, a cheater yeah. is a cheater and you're yeah. just now accepting, you're yeah. weak in some ways, the ideal is to leave or something. So, I mean, yeah. how, in what way do you say that a new relationship is possible? Yeah, but, but, but Omar, all those things are very like... Uh, uh, new agey you know if, if you if you look at uh, history of relationships over um, you know thousands of years mm. uh, infidelity and that possessiveness around relationship is a very new concept right relationships have historically been uh, treated with loyalty more than just commitment you know, so I think that that is also something that puts infidelity in this deep, dark corner. If that has happened, that is that is really doomed the relationship forever. Whereas it's kind of something that's always been around and part of a relational development. <laughs> Yep. You know, so and again, it's a, it's a, it's an unpopular opinion, yeah. but um, it's like Esther Perel also says that, that uh, primary yes. couple always exists in the shadow of a third, so that that yes. always exists. And yes. I mean, and if people are interested, I think Esther Perel is a, is a very interesting sort of uh, resource. Voice and, and she actually mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, when I read her work on infidelity for the first time, I was like, I've been saying that mm -hmm. for some time now, and I feel so alone saying it and feels like oh you know what are you <laughs> trying to mm. propagate here but uh, uh, she actually put a lot of that into context um, right so just so you know it's painful to be mm. be in this mess but this is this can also be a step towards relational development mm. right? okay all right, um, Mariam, I know there are lots of other questions, but these are the ones, the main themes that, that I, I wanted to pick up today. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, I hope that we can have another chat. Yes, thank you so much, Amar. Thank you. All right.